This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 204, recorded on February 26th, 2015. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, all three engines up and burning, 2, 1, 0, and liftoff, the final liftoff of the class. Here on Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your hands. News reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the Average Guy.tv studio here in a super cold, I mean, very, very cold and blustery Bellevue, Nebraska. We're going to see negative wind chills like negative 10 or 11 tonight. Just a little chilly. Turn on the electric blanket, and all is good here. And of course, we post the show with world class show notes each week out at the Average Guy. TV. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, of course you can contact me. Just send me an email, uh, Jim at the Average Guy TV. You can track us down on Twitter at Jay Collison. I'll get you there. Although, and I haven't talked about this in a while. If you want to follow the Average Guy TV on Twitter, just at the Average Guy TV, all in word, um, that uh, generates some RSS posts, so various tech uh, RSS feeds that I follow and such. And sometimes we talk about the show a little bit. You can follow that one as well. It is an auto tweeter, so. Just be careful if you go out there, but at the average guy uh, TV if you want to follow me on Twitter. Of course, you can call in those questions as well, 402-478-8450. And, of course, we'll play the questions right here on the show. The Average Guy TV, of course, is powered by the awesome web hosting of Maple Grove Partners and the guy that's behind it sitting right across from me over there in the camera. And, uh, of course, you can find, if you're looking at doing some uh, some web hosting, you can get in, as little, get in for as little as $10 a month. Love to have you do that. Check it out, maplegrovepartners.com. And we did a home tech tip about it if you want to go back and get more. I think that's 13, home tech tip 13. Uh, just about 10 minutes of talking about what's going on over there. And, of course, Home Gadget Geeks is now a part of the Geeks Network. You can find the links to this show and many other great podcasts. And we're going to add an Apple podcast here in the next couple weeks out at thegeeksnetwork.com. Join us in chat, listen, or watch live on YouTube, on Spreaker, also on Mixler and all the navigation and everything you need to subscribe, everything you could ever want or need is out at theaverageguy.tv. All right, well, uh, it's kind of uh, it's good to have Christian back on Home Gadget Geeks. We typically see him over at Cyber Frontiers, and if you haven't caught Cyber Frontiers 18, you might want to do that because that is the time, second only second day I had ever seen Christian in the flesh in person. <laughs> Christian, welcome to Home Gadget Geeks. Hey, thanks. Good to be here. And uh, yeah, good to get back on Home Gadget Geeks. I feel like I haven't been on here since the Uptime Robot conversation. Or no, no actually, I mean, Amber with LastPass. Amber with LastPass. Um, but so. we're using you sparingly here, you know, on Home sure. Gadget Geeks. And it's good to have you back in. We've we've struggled, and I think this is just going to be the pattern with Cyber Frontiers, where you guys get busier and busier and busier as the semester goes on, and uh, and so it gets harder to get things scheduled, and so that'll stretch itself out through midterms or whatever you guys have, and then it gets better again. And then, of course, as finals comes, that's just part of the academic perspective. That's yeah, it. <laughs> it's, all, it's all bundled in the intro. Full disclaimers ahead of, note, ahead of time. Yeah, so we, uh, we did have a good trip out to Washington, D.C., and many of you, because a lot of you are, I mean, because this podcast is a lot like family, many of you follow where I go and what I do and, and what we do, and so uh, last week, I got the opportunity, flew out on Sunday uh, to Washington, D.C. I haven't been out there in a decade or, or more, which is crazy to think. It's taken me that long to get back to D.C., but been all over the country, the rest of the country, over the last five or six years, out to the West Coast and down South, and I've done all kinds of travel. I just never made it out to the East Coast. And so, um, of course, for the last five years, I've known Christian, four of those or so, four and a half of those we've been podcasting together. And uh, and so we got the real first kind of this is this was the craziness of it the first time I ever really got a chance to meet him in person and so it's great to get out there it was uh, we got uh, Ashton and and uh, Colin started at Gallup I mean here's the beauty of the work life balance it's all one thing for us at the moment we're working together we're living together we're podcasting together literally you guys Colin and Ashton are super close right there on the floor right yeah. Yeah, Ashton's right behind me. Colin's down that way. Yeah, and so it was awesome to come in into into, into Aces and see the center, and it's a God, it's an awesome building. And uh, Christian gave me a tour of all kinds of cool stuff, uh, including uh, I got to meet Bruce, the backbone of Route D of the internet, <laughs> right? D root, D root, D root, yeah, uh, yeah D root. 
um, I wanna, why, why do I want to say root D? But D root. And, well, uh, yeah, it's, it's D dash root, but yeah. call it the D root yeah. internet server. The D root. And so Bruce is exact. Bruce, super smart, got about 8 million monitors in his office. It's got to be super hot in there. For, yeah. He's got to have his own, his own HVAC. But I got a tour of a whole bunch of stuff in Maryland. It was awesome to be out there. And uh, Christian, thanks for all the work that you did to make that uh, to make it happen. Yeah, you bet. And you got to see who runs the internet, who's pulling the strings manually. <laughs> yeah. No, it literally, it's this one guy. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty cool. Hey, we got to figure out how to hook him up with Vent, by the way. we've That's the one of the things I want to make happen yep. is have Bruce get get a few minutes of uh, Vent Surf's time. So uh, it'd be good. So got a great, uh, uh, had a great time out there. Tried to, tried to meet up with um, with Chris Barnes. And we just could not get our schedules to mesh. I was I was uh, super disappointed that we couldn't pull that off. The weather got a little screwy on us, and we actually so Mark Goldstein too, who we have on tonight, who we're gonna have on tonight. He might still yet show up. Um, we had scheduled some time with him, and uh, and so that was uh, we missed those opportunities there to get that done. Spent a lot of time uh, with uh, with Ashton uh, as well as with Colin, and uh, so it was good for me to get that done and get them met. Uh, and so it was good. All in all, good trip. Any, any Christian, any thoughts from your side? Anything that was uh, that worked out particularly well for you? Yeah, I mean, I th- it was well. It was great getting Ashton and Colin out in the office on the first day and having having the the go to support for them. And uh, you know, I think you you guys got to see a lot of the university. I'm actually pretty impressed with how much we were able to pack in and in the two days you were on campus. So that was, I think, pretty productive for for three days there. Yeah, and don't forget Cyber Frontiers 18. We recorded there. That was Tuesday. It was a right. snow day. Yeah, that was so great. We pulled the guys together and we went down into the lab and we spun. We put the mic. We took Christian's mic that he's using right there, put that in the middle of the table, and we just spun that around. And I edited all the parts out that were where we were spinning the mic around. So it really looks like everybody's got their own mic, but in reality, we're just all sharing one mic. We found out that. That's actually not a bad way to go about it because it keeps certain people from hogging the mic. Like you know? me. <laughs> that's, that's what we mean by certain people. Let's not fool ourselves. Uh, well, you know what? All you guys can talk, including me too, right? I mean, that's, that's one of those things that, that uh, it, uh, it makes it uh, easy to do when you've got a mic in front of you to kind of to, to talk. But that really, uh, we got a really good look, and 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 we interviewed Franz. I was trying to remember which Cyber Frontiers we had Franz on, but he talks about some software he's developing for this, these kind of cyber. What would you call them? The programs. Um, they're um, they're like challenges, like uh, it's very similar to hackathons, except for cybersecurity. And basically, anyone from the ground up who knows virtually nothing about cybersecurity, all the way through your advanced guys, can compete in this um, in this game environment. And they're doing this competition uh, in a couple weeks, I think March 7th. And there's going to be about 300 some students across the state and even some out of state people are coming for the event. Um, And it's all hosted on a platform that he custom developed that is very different from most of the hackathon type uh, game challenges you see out there and uh, doing a stellar job running with it as an LLC. And uh, um, we're all going to be there to support him. And uh, we We've already registered our team to be out there and compete for the cash prize, so it'll nice. be fun. Nice. No, it was awesome because uh, you come into the hallway and you come through a door, and then there's two more doors, and Christian and Jeremy are there, and Franz and Kevin, right? Or uh, Andy. Andy. Yeah. Andy, you're next door. And uh, and so it's just fun to be in person, hang out. I, there's you know, hang out the, on the couch, on the mini couch, for little little people, little children. Yeah. It's our gremlin uh, couch. <laughs> it's really small, and uh, hang out in there. So the walking around the campus, seeing those, seeing what we saw when we walked around on on Tuesday, the campus was pretty much deserted, and so we kind of had the place to ourselves, which was pretty cool. No traffic, no other people to contend with, just doors that you had to pull on. Some yeah. of them harder than others. <laughs> if locked, just pull and try again. <laughs> We're, uh, it's a funny story. We're going, can I tell this story? Sure. Is that, is that okay? So we're going up to this one building and Christian's like, maybe I can get in. And so he swipes his card. No, nope, it doesn't let him in. So we're walking away and we see this other student walking up and he's like, Hey, just turn around and act like you know what you're doing. We're going to get into this building. 
So he comes up to the door, doesn't swipe his card, just grabs the handle, and it doesn't, it just, you know, it's locked. So I'm thinking, well, he'll pull his card out. Nope. He just bears down on the door and just yanks the thing open. It was pretty bad. <laughs> was In the realm of bad, it was terrible. I know. It was awful. And we just looked at each other. Christian and I just looked at each other. So the, the joke the rest of the day was, well, if the door doesn't open, just pull harder on it. And uh, it's just hilarious that uh, that it worked that way. So we had a lot of fun. So it was good to get together. Again, Cyber Frontiers 18, if you haven't downloaded that. And that's not terribly nerdy. Uh, you know, if oh, you, it's a pretty average guy. Yeah. yeah and, that's and, a, and you get to see the sky cam, which is pretty cool. We did a shot, basically, where each one of us had a camera facing us as we were talking. But then there's also, I call it the sky cam. We put a webcam up kind of close to the ceiling that's looking down over the table with all the laptops and us sitting around in a circle. So it's a pretty cool uh, visual effect. And uh you know, the conversation was pretty average guy, so I think you would enjoy it. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. And then Tuesday night, and John's out there in chat. We got together with John for dinner, and it was just good to spend some time with him and, and chat with him a little bit. So it was good to uh, – we had – it just was the best time. I was busy from – I mean, I got there Sunday, and I left Thursday morning super early, and I didn't take a break Yeah. Uh, the whole time. We, we certainly kept you busy. all the time. Yeah. No, it was super good. So – so, again, Christian, thanks for kind of you hosting bet. me. You set all that up, and uh, you do a pretty good job of that, and it kept me busy, kind of gave me an itinerary of two days before. You're like, okay, follow this. <laughs> and uh, and we just had a good time. It's, I'll, I'll be honest, super important for me now. Now that I've seen your environment, and it just makes a lot more sense. It'll help me manage you guys better. I kind of understand the dynamics of the D.C. office. and So just so much better. Uh, being out there to see you guys, so it uh, so it makes sense for sure. Yeah, no, it's good. Well, we want to talk a little bit about. Let's dig right in. And and uh, if you're if this is the first time you've listened to the show and you made it through all of that, congratulations. By the way, that's a lot of inside baseball. Uh, we are a podcast. Uh, and by the way, I saw Addie come in earlier. Addie, welcome. Thanks for coming out. Addie has been a guest on the show before, so good to see her. And we've got some. It's kind of like the chat room is kind of a who's who of the community at this point. I'm seeing – I don't know what I did this week, but everybody's everybody's kind of jumping in. So thanks, guys, for coming out. And it's a big chat room. We haven't had 20 in a long time out there, and that's what we got tonight. But, um, you know, we're kind of a tech community. I think uh, one of the best tech communities out there, and uh, oftentimes we will spend some time just talking about that. And so if you made it this far, thanks for doing that. Uh, we'll dig in. Uh, with a little bit of uh, of that. So John uh, just says in chat, he said he just finished Cyber Frontiers 18 on his commute home tonight, and uh, you're welcome, John. We uh, we had a fun time doing it. It was it was good just to talk. To, I went, you know, I had to edit that thing. I actually went back and listened to it twice, and uh, uh, pretty good stuff. So if you're don't be don't be put off by the Cyber Frontiers heady mantra that that thing has. So this is. You'll get to know these kids, and uh, and so be good for it. Go out there and listen to it, Christian. Since we were there, we're talking about cybersecurity. I kind of it's interesting. I learned about the Aces program while I was there. That while it has a cybersecurity component to it, it really is a mixture of a bunch of different degrees, right? So cybersecurity yeah. is part of it, but it also blends in other degrees, right? I mean, there's other disciplines going on in that in that program. Yeah, and so actually, you know, it's not like you're getting a major in cybersecurity, right? It's part of your honor citations. And so, uh, yeah, there's a good amount of computer science and computer engineering majors. But, yeah, we have math majors. We have business majors. We have government and politics. We have psychology, um, so criminology. So um, there is that kind of interdisciplinary component that does work really well in the ACES-1 program. And it helps uh, with team projects especially, um, and it helps kind of do, uh, do some projects that make people think differently than just how the computer scientist would or how the mathematician would. So it's a very healthy environment to be in, and uh, the students enjoy their company just because it's not the same old, same old, so to speak. Yeah, I was super impressed at the way the the, the programs mix with each other there a little bit. We got to spend some time in, the, in, in those, and you guys, you know, certainly you have, as we walked around campus, uh, everybody knows you. Uh, it seems like, hey, Christian, what's going on, Christian? Reminds me of that uh, uh, in Iron Giant, you know, see you later, Hogarth. <laughs> so it, uh, it, you're you're certainly known there. It felt very, very comfortable to me while I was there. I just, I kind of settled in 
you know, yeah. uh, we just we hang out in the lounge. And at one point on, I think on Wednesday, I'm like, I'm just going to go down to the lounge and get some work done. <laughs> And uh, and was able to go down there super comfortable, and it was pretty good. So it's not just kind of sit down and grind it out. I mean, you guys really get – I mean, you do have to do a lot of that, but there's a lot of different disciplines in there. I think you'll hear in Cyber Frontiers 18, uh, Colin comes at it really from a different angle than you do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in a lot of ways. And even Franz and what Franz is doing yeah. uh, is different. So. Yeah. Jeremy has a different angle. It's just kind of cool. You, you're not – you don't get the same message from everybody. And, uh, right. When I talk with the the staff there, that's really their goal is to get you guys to intermingle with each other in your programs, right. and so that you're learning these these disciplines, but that the the, the disciplines are colliding together, and uh, yeah. so it's great. That's yeah. really cool. No, that's pretty awesome. Um, let's see. Where do we want to start? You know, let's just we talk about let's talk about let's go back a little bit when we talk about some computer security and and we talk about average guy stuff and. Some of the stuff you learned. Uh, Mark was kind enough to provide some notes for us. I'm, I'm going to go through that. You know, one of the here's some recommendations that a lot of security guys give. And we're going to kind of just work through them one by one and, and say what we do with them and 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 uh, and such. So when we talk about, first of all, I've created. Uh, if if you look at my last pass uh, uh, vault, I got like 230 different accounts all over the place. And I'm using the same e email address for them, for most of them, right? Mm -hmm. Mark recommends in here never use a real email address for, for, you know, for registration and stuff. That, to me, that would, I would just use the same fake email address, right, for right. them all, right? What's, from Christian, from your standpoint, I mean, what's really practical when we talk about signing up for services? Do you have any system that you use that, Maybe for some services you use one, and for other services you use another, or you get a disposable one, or things like that. Yeah, I mean, I have like ten different email boxes that I all manage out of my Outlook, so there, you know, I kind of filter different things accordingly. Um, the the interesting thing, Mark. Um, points out in the show notes is that there are these services like the Albine software that basically whenever it sees a registration form that asks for an email field, it just generates like this random 20 character um, email reflector. That's just a completely random address that when they send you an email from that, it will, it will go to your real email address. And then at any time you're like, Hey, I don't want this mail anymore. You just kill the, the reflector and then it's gone. So it's a nice way to have that, to not have any addresses given for that matter, but still receive messages for activation and for other things. Um, so that's effective. I mean, I think a lot of people have their, you know, my spam email at yahoo.com type inbox and, you know, that's fine too. Um, and, and, you know, I get to the point where I read so many emails a day. Yeah, it's great if I can cut back on the on the ones that are just really annoying where I get the instant notification. Like, I that I try and make sure as much as possible stay spam free because I hate if I get a push notification on my phone, I want it to be something important that I need to respond to, not some, hey, 10% discount if you order now. And then you're just like, oh, why did I even look at my phone? Um, so those inboxes I try and keep super clean, but eh, do I really care if it shows up in my other inboxes? Not really. It doesn't bother me. Maybe yeah, and I, me. I guess a good practice would be to maybe – uh, separating your banking email addresses from yeah, those are right. good practices too. Because oh. if uh, you know if someone manages to breach the database that they're holding with your account information and your emails in there, they might start using those email addresses to figure out what's your bank account. Maybe your bank account uses this as a login, and you know, it's a uh, it's a constant game of basically linking those these disparate systems together with your metadata. And email is a great identifier, so. Yeah, and it's it's just another one of those things of reducing the attack surface, right? Which is, yeah. it's just a different account. Could they find that? Sure, they're gonna have to work at it. And again, if they don't have to work at it, the attack the attack surface is larger. If it's one thing I hope I preached about in the time I podcasted, it's it's all about the attack surface. Just yeah. take the biggest variables that make you a, a wide walking target and turn yourself into a a lean figure and it's you know it's like when the dart is coming head on at you and instead you turn sideways it's the same thing you know has has a third of the chance of hitting you if you're standing sideways instead right of that. yeah just because you're not going to get completely out of the way right. right i mean there's just times you're going to be in the way and we certainly have 
heard that, and, then, and there's systems you, you cannot always guarantee that everything you're on is safe and secure, even though you're doing all the right things. There, you know, you might run in, you might set an account up at some other place, and that account gets uh, that gets hacked. Sure. And you can't have a different email address. I mean, unless you're using what, you, like you were talking about before, it's tough to have a different email address for everything. Um, but separating banking are the really important ones. One of the things that uh, Mark talked about is he says never do banking on a mobile phone ever. Christian, do you know why or what, it, when we think about yeah. that, certainly, you know, I was talking to a guy the other day, and he was like, yeah, I could just take this phone, especially Android, plug it in. Who was this? And where was I? I think it was at the university this week. And he was like, uh, do you know your phone has 77 different databases, and they're all, they all have passwords in the clear on them, on your phone? And I was like, really? And, and so it was one of those, how much of that, I mean, I didn't verify it, but from a mobile standpoint and what you're thinking, do I need to be super concerned? Should I not do? I mean, Mark's going to say no. Your thoughts? Yeah, I'm kind of mixed about that. I mean, there's a phrase we have in ACES <laughs> that basically says physical access is the vulnerability of the worst kind, meaning that if someone has physical access to your device, who cares? Because at that point, they're going to get to your information one way or another. I can crack your phone a hundred ways to Sunday if I'm sitting down with it plugged in. I mean, that's that's pretty much like you know letting someone win a game of Monopoly, right? That's the equivalent in cybersecurity. Um, when you're using a banking application, e let's even assume for a minute that it's being stored in, in some clear text cache on your cell phone, right? to save your password, which by the way, my, my banking app doesn't. It asks me every time for my username and password. And every time it sees I'm connected to a new wireless point or a new IP of any kind, it asks me one of my security questions. So it knows what locations it should see me coming from because the cell phone carriers typically it can show coming up from a variety of different areas in your region. Um, it will prompt you. So uh, the big takeaway is that it's not like someone can be sniffing your cell phone traffic and seeing this password show up in the clear. No, the banks are not stupid. They're sending this out over encrypted SSL connections um, and your password is being transmitted in an encrypted fashion. Yeah, is it possible it's sitting somewhere in a database and some of these other applications? Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, you got to remember that as far as these devices have come in terms of being quad-core processors and having a good amount of memory and that kind of thing, it's still a mobile architecture. It's still using ARM Snapdragon CPUs, right? So developers are going to look for how do I maximize productivity and reduce the level of CPU usage Encrypting stuff on a device and having to encrypt and decrypt and manage a large database isn't part of the picture of mobile. Um, are these getting more uh, cost effective, smaller to implement and easier? Yeah, of course. Um, but, you know, your average mobile application is um, not secure. Um, and that's not just for banking. I mean, the majority... The majority of the applications you install on your phone are just not great examples of cybersecurity, right? I think the biggest thing that people can relate to in the public is Snapchat, right? Oh, <laughs> the device that really doesn't have, the photo never exists. It's always deleted. Well, that we all know that's uh, that was a great sales gimmick that managed to work for about a year. Obviously, it's a free app, so I don't know if sales gimmick's the appropriate word, but, you know, here we come to find out that, yeah, these images are actually stored just somewhere very convoluted on your cell phone. Yes, they're finding intricate ways to pull them back. Um, I think there was a guy who had found a way to wrote, write some kind of third-party app that was archiving these things and built this huge database that, of course, Snapchat refuted as not being their problem, basically. Um, just one example. I mean, any application you stall, install on your cell phone is, is sharing your data. I mean, uh, get used to it. Um, your GPS, if you're not careful with that, by default, if you're going to make a post on Facebook, it's probably going to say, yeah, you made that post near uh, Washington, D.C. or near Beltway Express or or checked in at the local McDonald's. I mean, these devices are designed to be extraordinarily good at capturing metadata, and they don't necessarily care if it's secure or protecting your privacy. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like the old PC days, <laughs> you yeah. know, when we first started, right? These phones are, are I think, inherently insecure in a lot of the way they do things. But sure. So mobile banking, I think you got to kind of take, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the banks have their own app. 
Right. And I think certainly uh, doing that within the app is probably better than trying to do it within the browser. Yep. A lot of them will push you to their own app because they know they've got some built-in security on right. that to make it work. So it's um, certainly one of those things that you want to be careful with, I think, with your Definitely. phone. It's, I, I, don't, I don't do a lot of banking on my phone. I check balances and that kind of stuff. I don't do a lot of banking in general. Maybe that's a bad thing. <laughs> Maybe I should do more. Uh, banking along those lines, but I definitely don't. Um, I definitely don't do it on my phone. Multi-factor authentication. We talked about this a little bit when we had LastPass. I have really implemented that everywhere at this point, as most as best I can from from that standpoint. It's a great practice. Um, yeah, you know, it's, and it's it's really it's a kind of a pain to get in to start with, but once you get used to it, now every time I log into Google from a different device, it'll send me a text, right? And then I gotta gotta put the code in and make it work. I've kind of learned to make that work, and I do it a lot. I do it maybe one or two times a day, it seems like, that I'm, I'm re-authenticating something, even to the point where I've turned my Yahoo Mail to log me out every day. Um, that was one of those kinds of things. I had some some weird spoofing going on with that Yahoo yeah. account. Maybe some of you got an email from me, and it wasn't from me, but it had my email address embedded in it, and certainly they had somehow gotten a hold of email addresses from from my address book somehow. I have since just cleared that address book out. I just deleted everything. Yeah, and, address uh, books are, are, you want to talk about clear text metadata pains, those are one of them. And I see it all the time too, like AOL accounts, just always get those emails. And you know it too. Uh, my latest game on Twitter has been when I get one of these tweets that are like, hey, at the WizBM, I really enjoyed this article with the link. And the link is, you know, the BS domain extension with, any and 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 I tell anyone who sends me this, I say, you're instantly more suspect when I see redirect.php as your URL. Are you sure you didn't get hacked? Question mark. And normally within two hours of that type of tweet, I get, oh, thanks for letting me know. I had no idea. So like, people don't tweet that back. Um, and people who are probably anxious on Twitter probably click these things, which I find humorous because if you just read the URL itself, you can realize like, yikes, this is a this is a scary thing. Um, I'm also really surprised that, uh, the fishers on Twitter that are out there, there are many of them, mind you, especially with all the, I mean, we all know how easy it is to compromise Twitter accounts, uh, given some of the high profile ones that were a couple months ago. Um, I'm very surprised that they don't use the URL shorteners like the Google URL shortener or bit.ly or any of these things to basically mask some of those ugly redirect.phps. I mean, I see something like that. I know in half a second, Hey, that's, <laughs> you don't want to go there. Um, but even I might be more inclined to click something that looks like it's properly URL shortened and has a halfway decent message and, um, kind of surprised at the level of for guys who are really smart at hacking passwords and getting these accounts, they sometimes do a less than seller job with the phishing aspect and making selling. You got to sell it to me, right? You got to be, you got to be a hacker number one and a sales associate number two. And if you're bad at either one, then you can't be in the business of being an illegal crook. So, <laughs> a sales associate. That's awesome. That was an earlier reference from pre-show. So, yeah. Um, you, uh, yeah, with Yahoo, right? I mean, uh, Drashna is saying, you know, AOL, Yahoo are horrible security, anti-spam stuff. I, those are accounts I've had my Yahoo account since 1996. I mean, it's just, it's just is what it is. But some measures I did, I went through and I took all the the addresses out. I just cleared the thing and deleted them all. I don't need an address book at Yahoo, so it's going to become my kind of insecure email account. Although. Moving stuff as you as you look at your last pass or whatever you're using to kind of keep track of stuff. Man, I got a lot of stuff there, so I've got to do some work to kind of segregate some things out. Two factor when I had that spoofing or whatever it's called again, I can still can't figure out how it happened because I went in and looked at everything. I looked at all the security logs for the email, which by the way, uh, both on like live and I think on Google and I think even on Yahoo, you can go back and see when you've logged in and who's attempted to log in on your account and when it was successful and where it was from. I don't know if all services have that, but I know at least, I, I was thinking maybe on the Microsoft stuff, on the live stuff, they give you really good, if you, lo if you drill into the settings, they give you really good audit logs on when, I'm assuming they're good, on when you tried to log in and from where. And it was really pretty interesting to see now, if you're on a service provider and you're getting routed to another hub somewhere, somewhere, you know, it might look like, hey, I'm in Omaha, but maybe my ISP is headquartered in Lincoln, and so it's it's like I logged in from Lincoln, and you're going to be like, no, I'm in Omaha. Well, 
you have to kind of take that into account, right? They're logging you in from wherever that ISP is or they're marking wherever that ISP is. But it was really helpful to be able to go back during that. I was trying to troubleshoot, okay, where did this come from? And I looked at all the logs. I could not find anyone logging into my account at, at that time. It was, seemed to be spread over a couple days or a couple weeks, actually. It seemed to be spread out. So not it wasn't like a big email blast. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there was some kind of tracking going on. or Although it was interesting, it was hitting people. I had, like, it hit my broker, and I haven't talked to him in, like, six years. <laughs> an old broker friend of mine. And I was like, seriously, you got an email from me? You know, I haven't used, I haven't communicated with him. I didn't even know I had his email address. The other thing that could be is it could be, could be doing some smart networking spam thing right. where it, it, like LinkedIn does, it starts doing that network analysis and starts putting people together to, and it could be, I don't know, does LinkedIn give, a, a, the, is the, is the, our email addresses on the public API for LinkedIn? Uh, not public, but there's weird way we've, there's been several exploits published in the past about leaking out LinkedIn emails that they've since patched, yeah. but I'm sure a good number of them are. Who knows? Broken. It was real frustrating because I keep getting these messages from people that are like, you got hacked. And I'm like, no, I didn't get hacked. Uh, one, it's two factor. And I've had my phone in my possession the whole time. Two, there's no, there's nothing left for them in there to hack anymore, and it's not coming from that account. So, it was a pretty interesting deal to come full circle. Two factor, I think, super important. If you're not using it, you have to use it in banking. Most banks have gone to some form of two factor, where it's at least a, at minimum, it's a picture you have to, you have, or something you have to go through on the site to click it, right? Yeah. Type deal, um, as well as a password, but. Especially with uh, Microsoft and Google and Yahoo, I've turned on two-factor. So if you haven't done that yet, you might want to consider going out and, uh, and taking a look at those things um, and doing that um, as well. Uh, uh, coming up here in just a few minutes, we'll do an Ask Me Anything or Ask Christian Anything. We've done that before. And, and uh, so you might want to cue those questions up uh, as we do that. One of the things... Uh, Mark had in his notes that I do want to talk about. When we we don't we don't talk about this a lot here on Home Gadget Geeks, but when we talk about your finances, it is probably because of of everything that's going on and identity theft is so prevalent. I saw some ridiculous number, like one in ten or something like that, when it comes to having your identity stolen. It's a pretty high number right now. One of the things you might want to think about doing is finding the best way to get your your credit checked. Because that's gonna that's gonna be a huge flag, uh, that's gonna pop up if all of a sudden there are you know you, uh, you see when you do a credit check you see who's checking if people are trying to uh, take out loans in your name or they're trying to you know to purchase things uh, using that or uh, there's been some cases where they bought some big stuff with it. Of course, uh, checking your credit will help to know if maybe someone is trying to impersonate you or is trying to steal your identity. There's a great, uh, the reason I bring this up, there's a great online service that I found that we actually talk about through our credit union called Credit Karma. Just it's credit, just like it's spelled C R E D I T, Karma, K A R M A. Great service that'll actually, for free, do, it'll check, you can do a credit check for free online, as well as it does some monitoring in your account as well. And there are paid options there. Uh, I think um, there's some paid security options um, like LifeLock that you can give them all your information and uh, they will monitor your account for you. But it's kind of probably time to start putting tech in your favor and using some of these services to just kind of help. Again, you're gun it's not a matter of if, but it's when. And it's when it, if you've got someone kind of watching out for you, the credit card companies do some things that if all of a sudden they see wonky. I was out, where was I out? I was, oh, I was out in Washington at the MVP conference and I was buying the Surface. And the card wouldn't work. I was like, what the? And it's because I'd used it for a purchase earlier. I'd bought a keyboard from the Microsoft store there in Redmond. And the, it, they, called, they called Sarah and said, hey, are you in Redmond? You know, are you, yeah, are you in Redmond or traveling or something, whatever? And she was like, well, I don't know what he's doing. You better just stop it just in case. Well, when I went to go back to buy the, the Surface, the card had been shut off. And so I had to do some juggling to make that work but um, so credit card companies are getting into that with a lot of their data you know their data alerting and mining and some of the things that they're doing 
but this Credit Karma is a great way to do it. Um, and so there's some other opportunities out there. Uh, Drashna, not a big fan in the chat of, of LifeLock. Um, and so it's one of those kinds of things. Uh, the CEO put his social security number online back in the day and said, go ahead and try and hack me. Well, you know, you know how that's going to go, right, Christian, if you put yep. your... If you put your uh... mind's out there, so I uh, I'm signed up with Experian because of the data breach on campus, so it happens. And so, did you with Experian? Did you sign up? Do they have like a credit monitoring service yeah. that you sign up for, and they gave it to you free because of the breach? Yeah, so I have university has me covered for five years. Yeah, and that's one of those things. I think you got to go. You got you know, if lots of times, if you were part of the target breach, you got an opportunity to sign up with one of these credit monitoring services. Um, a lot of the banks, if that if they get hit, or a, a lot of organizations, they'll. That's kind of the way they're handling it now. They're like, okay, <laughs> your stuff is out. We're going to give you a free year, or um, you know, something along those lines. So, it's um. You know, everybody comes out. This is a, such a touchy subject because everybody comes at their money in a different way. You know, they. Some people, it's like I never, I'm never going to do that, and some people are like, oh yeah, I'll trust everybody with everything. But um, w one of those interesting services, I tried this about a year ago, and I get some alerts from them from time to time. Not a bad. You try it, try it at your own risk. But Credit Karma uh, is kind of a way of uh, of in, of getting at least getting your. Because if all of a sudden your credit re if your credit score begins to plummet, and by the way, in America, you can't do much without a good credit score. Yeah, it right. affects a lot of stuff, including like what you pay for uh, homeowners insurance and car insurance and mortgages and those kinds of things. If you see a plummet in your in your uh, credit score, uh, you might have some things going on mm -hmm. that you don't know about. So. Anything else, Christian, when we talk about just kind of general before we kind of dig in a little bit, this would be the time to put your questions in chat. So if you got a, uh, we'll do a Ask Christian Anything moment here for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, and you can ask him anything. Christian, anything else that when we, when we think about kind of average guy security stuff besides passwords and some of the other stuff we've talked about, anything else you can think of? Um, yeah, I, well, I'm just going to say some really baseline boring stuff that I doesn't seem like it seems very common sense but people I think are, are not aware of it in the sense that they think it won't be an issue um, stop writing down your passwords on sticky notes just stop doing it it's so bad it is so bad you think no one's gonna see it except you and your secretary and then someone does and it's a big problem just don't do it if you're if you're buying the software for LastPass, don't do it. If you've got RoboForm or anything else, just don't do it. Like if if you're starting to think yourself, oh, let me just jot this down real quick. I'll change it later. Just don't throw the pen out the window first, or put the <laughs> sticky notes out of reach. Just don't do it. I I I I've walked into several places now where I see monitors, even in in well, I've seen it in workplaces before too, where the sticky notes on the bottom with a little pad. It's just don't do it. Just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't write them down. Yeah, that's, that's not what they're for. There, there are some great apps to do that. We've highlighted LastPass, RoboForm is another one of those kinds of things. There's some, and you know what? You're giving up a little security in that, right? I mean, yeah. you're it, you're putting it there. There's unless you're smart enough to memorize every single password, and they're all different. You're gonna have to rely on something. Yeah, and uh, don't don't be. I mean, there's plenty of people who literally go dumpster diving for. They, they find out where big corporations have their waste management taken to, and they go, they'll go diving for passwords all day long. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, what else? I, I think one big thing that I've, even for someone who's very sensitive about these things, continue to become more and more advocate about for the average guy is cookie management. Do not let your cookies kind of just grow out of control like a wandering Waldo and not clear them for three years because that really does build up a footprint that is like, whoo, bazinga scary in terms of getting very targeted advertising in terms of websites being able to track you across domains and visits. You're building a really rich data footprint that's feeding the pockets of some large corporation by you doing that. I used to joke every single day when my roommate 
very characteristically that the one activity he does every single night before he goes to bed is opens up CC cleaner and clears his cookies. I used to give him crap for it every single night. I said, what are you doing? This is an, an insane ritual that you're doing for the sake of doing it, not because it really means anything. And then the more and more I sat and thought about it, I'm like, yeah, that's a really smart idea. You don't you don't really need those persistent cookies on there, especially if you have a software like LastPass where it's remembering your passwords. You don't need to have cookies to keep you logged in because you you know it's going to be auto-filled for you anyway. Um, so try and make the smart choice to maybe just set your computer to automatically clean them after a couple days so that you don't have to worry about it. But that seems to be a bigger tip to me when we talk, want to talk about not necessarily, it's a, it's not necessarily an attack surface. It is a vector. Um, and it, it definitely lets, uh, advertising agencies track you like nothing else. Um, Hey, bring your microphone just a smidge closer yeah, sure. for me. Sorry, Sorry about that. that. And then how do you, uh, how do you feel about the incognito or, or surfing yeah. you know, that way? What, What's your I mean, opinion that, on that? It's a great tool, right? So I use the incognito window in Chrome whenever I'm using a software like Songza, which I know, I mean, Songza is great. I love it to death, so I will never stop using it. Um, but I'll certainly put it in an incognito mode because I know it's probably going to go looking at my cookies and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I do use those relatively frequently, um, and they're, they're a good resource. Um, Again, you're much more inclined, though, to do more than 90% of your browsing in a regular window, and and you, it won't always come to you to go in incognito, which is why it kind of makes sense to set up a cookie removal policy, just because that way you, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but yeah, they're, they're effective. Okay. I've never, I, I never do that, and I, that's another thing I should probably think about doing from time to time. Is yeah, when you're it's, using it's a really services. smart thing to do. Not to mention it makes your browser faster, right? It doesn't have to save and remember all that data, but uh, it certainly helps reduce your privacy footprint on the internet. Yeah. Well, it's um. What about what about plugins to block cookies? Is that another option? Yeah. So the Albine software does have some of that. Um, I think AdBlock Plus might do some of that. Um, I'm a big fan of the host blocker because it blocks almost all the advertising agencies from being able to contact your computer, which is awesome. I have never had to watch a commercial on, you know, like, you know how like CBS, you can get full episodes in HD and that kind of thing. And there's normally like three minutes of commercials in between the set points they have. I've never had to watch a commercial in, in years because it just, everything gets dropped. Same with YouTube. I haven't watched a commercial on YouTube in forever. Um, so that's a great tool just because it's, it's not only making my privacy better, but it's making my quality of using the internet fantastic. I love it. I've never taken it off. Um, so that's really great. Um, cookies. Yeah. The, you can also in internet Explorer, Chrome or uh, Firefox that you can actually set what type of cookies your browser allows by default. So I think by default, it's a pretty permissive policy where you basically, you allow any type of third party cookie that looks relatively fine. And unless it looks super sketchy or suspicious, your browser is going to cache it and do whatever you can set that higher so that it, it um, blocks more cookies from being downloaded that may or may not impact the usability of some of the websites you're on, which is why, again, if you want kind of that nice balance of usability and not having that long-term footprint that's building your signature on the internet show up, that's why that clearing policy is great. But yeah, you can also kind of block them from showing up in the first place. I used to think, I used to, I, I used to do this with Internet Explorer back in the day. Um, obviously, like 90 some percent of the market has moved off Internet Explorer. Rumorings with Windows 10 is that it won't be Internet Explorer. They're working on this whole new next generation browser to compete, which I think it's like about time that they ditched the name Internet Explorer because I think people, it doesn't matter. Like the average Joe, like our super average Joe, that name is dead. Like Internet Explorer, oh, do I have to use that? It's like the first thing I hear with new hires too. Uh, do I have to use it? Can can I get a software request for like Chrome or something, right? So Microsoft's making a smart move to not make Internet Explorer 12 or 13 or whatever. <laughs> they probably stopped at 13, right? Because it's that voodoo number and it's already in the crapper anyway. So yeah. um, that's that's pretty great. Yeah, it, and out in chat, MVPS host blocker is is what I use. It's, it's super primo. Um, I will never have it disabled no matter what anyone tells me. Um, and I recommend it everywhere. And actually, for people who are really uh, are just 
you know, your neighbor that always manages to get a virus every six months. In my case, it's my uncle every six months. I can pretty much time when I'm going to get the next call. Um, host blocker, tell them to install it. <laughs> the call volume drops significantly in your help and support center uh, just because it can help with a lot of those phishing and redirect attacks which start the virus um, injections in the first place. A lot of love out there for uBlock. Uh, uh, Ken says uBlock is much lighter and faster than AdBlock Plus. Yeah, I believe it. I mean, the great thing about the host blockers, it's no software. It is literally you basically breaking the DNS system for all ad agencies. And so it, it works on anything, whether it's a browser or a software application installed on your desktop. Um, it can be a really great way to do that. We used, uh, for a lot of years, for the kids, we used K9, uh, just the letter K and 9. Uh, blue, uh, let's see, blue, not Bluehost. That's the host provider. Um, Oh, that's escaping me, the name of the company. It'll come to me in just a second. Blue Coat, that's who it is. It's Blue Coat. Um, and for being a web filtering tool uh, for the kids, so they'd kind of keep them out of trouble in those days before, we, we use Open DNS now kind of on the routers. And with most of the kids being teenagers, and I'm not as worried about it as I was when they were, when the boys were, you know, 14, 12, and 10. Um, uh, OpenDNS took care of some of that uh, for us. Canine blocked ads very, very well. One of the drawbacks to it, though, is they block ads and they put their own little, like, hey, this was blocked by Canine. And so the page just, the page looked awful. But I had Sarah several times say, can you put Canine back on my PC, open it up just to block the ads? And mm -hmm. so that was another that was another way. I get that question a lot from parents. What can I use to kind of help? kind of filter or monitor or whatever if you want to do it at the if you want to do it at the router level and of course I like I'm, I'm a big fan of open DNS as kind of minimum standard I can't think of any good reason not to use them can you think uh, with open DNS is there a good reason not to just have them standard as one level of protection no I mean I think those services are all relatively average kind of things to employ I wouldn't necessarily say that's a bad thing to use okay and K9 was another one of those options if you've got young kids. It's worth a look. It's free. They have a free version of it that's available. They sell their enterprise security, and that's kind of what makes them, um, you know, makes them the money. But uh, that seemed to work uh, pretty well for me. One little trick. Well, I was still waiting for some questions. I thought these guys would throw some really hard questions in here in chat. I guess maybe they're sleeping out there tonight. But um, I got some on email. But oh, okay. Uh, we'll start those here in just a second. So. One of the other things that I did with my mom, because she's just, she's terrible at clicking. I mean, she is click happy. And so I deployed, in fact, my, on, on, um, on, uh, hold on one sec here. I just got a pop-up alert on her PC that her antivirus is out of. Uh, so, you know, I'm using TeamViewer, and, uh, and so that'll warn you, hey, the other PC's antivirus is out of date for my mom's computer that just popped up as I was talking about her, which is a little scary. But I did the trick where I I closed I became the administrator account for her and then I just gave her a regular account right a regular user account, and so now when everything pops up when I get the the user control that pops up when it's trying to install something she of course can't do it because it has my username and password there's no reason my mom should be installing software on mm -hmm. that PC unless she needs me so that that seems that trick and I think I've heard a lot of security guys say never be on as an admin. Do you follow that policy at all, Christian? Or are you an admin on the box every single time? Yeah, I, that's actually a really good point. I, um, I've i been thinking about that myself just because um, it's a great tool in the sense that a lot of viruses can have trouble elevating out of UAC. UAC is very well architected. So even having your regular account be a regular user that you know what the administrator password is by being in that less privileged environment when you're using your computer and then just putting in your administrator password when you need to do an install, that's a super great way to keep your computer from getting completely hosed by some of the nasty stuff. Um, of course, my motto as being a cybersecurity professional in training is that if I can't keep my stuff secure with full things running, then I'm doing something wrong with my education. So for me, it's not the best advice, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really effective thing. It's not intrusive. And yeah, when you got to do an install, pop in your password and boom. Yeah. And, and so Drashna says, you know, never, ever, ever be on an account that has full admin access, right? 
and then he says, I say running under the domain user account. <laughs> you know, we, we're, we're probably bad about this because we're so used to just having full privileges on the PC. It is one of those things. Uh, I, I kind of tested this out on her, and so I just flipped that over. Now, the other night I was doing something for her, and bum, bum, you know, that the, the user control popped up, and I'm like, oh, this is working. I, <laughs> what was I installing for her? There was something else. I think I wanted to install something. I can't remember now. And I got the control, and I thought, oh, great. This is working exactly the way it's supposed to, and I put my username and password, and, uh, and it worked out well. So... A good little t a tip. I think that's a good tip for the kids is you become the admin, you create an account for them to log into. That's really good on Windows 8 and beyond. That part works out really, really well, especially if they have their own Microsoft account. Right. So they'll get their own settings back and all that other stuff. So uh, pretty good way, pretty good way to go about it, and that's what I've got her going. In fact, tonight I was uh, in there doing something on her PC just before the show, and it logged me off, and it was her account. I don't know what her password is, and I could have logged in as me, but I just left it. I thought she'll be fine. When I get mm. so yeah. Another, another good. I think another good tip when it comes that way. Um, what do you got? Uh, what do you got in the email? Sure. Let's take a look. So, from Ken out in chat. We, wow, I got four questions. Okay. So, number one on the list: Have you set up redundant routers for the Maple Grove Partners platform, and how do you go about, or how did you go about doing that? Um, so I actually haven't yet, primarily because my life has taken a turn for the more busy, which seems to be characteristic. However, um, the plan would and still is to use the PFSense um, redundant uh, router configuration. So I use PFSense for a lot of my production edge stuff just because it's a super solid platform. And you can set up both uh, failover PFSense configurations and uh, kind of re uh, redundant uh, gateways out through the network. So... Um, I am basically holding off on a couple things. Um, I'm thinking about working with Verizon once we kind of expand up to the next tier of, in terms of number of customers we have on the platform, um, re-architecting our IP block to have a, a nice healthy block of static IPs that I'll then route through um, several different gateways so that they're basically split up over um, the entire, I guess, network space of, of publicly routable addresses and that way um, there should be no single point of failure on the on the edge um, so that's helpful number two uh, was git or svn this is a software development question if you're not familiar with versioning control um, which is a obviously a big topic for any software engineer i tend to preference git a little more i have to use both for some of the projects i'm working on right now so it's great to be um I guess communicative in both um, and, and work well with both of them, but I do have a little bit of a bias for Git. Um, three is, have you ever heard of BitLocker being broken by design in Windows 8? I've heard that it's using AES CBC with zero byte initialization vectors. I don't. I haven't heard that particular report. Um, it, it, number one, it wouldn't surprise me. Number two, I don't trust um, these types of encryption softwares. The other one I would um, reference is the TrueCrypt software that um, that we talked about that had that very bizarre website posting where everyone thought it was the most secure, free encryption thing out there, and then everyone was kind of unsure what actually happened to that thing. Um, one of the best encryption techniques for a laptop, which is basically where Bitfender, Bitdefender would be most applicable, is data at rest encryption. That's that's what the enterprise has moved to. Um, Sophos is a company that does uh, DAR data at rest very well. Norden also has a part of its Norden Ghosts uh, product division has data at rest encryption software. Those are the kinds of solutions you want to be looking towards. I don't. I, BitLocker makes me a little bit nervous. Um, any updates on Google rankings or SEO tips? Well, so I, I do have some feedback on that. Um, the average guy has noticed a considerable boost in our traffic, um, and that's primarily been with submitting the site map using. Uh, I want to say we're using uh, we're using a we're using one of many WordPress Google SEO sitemap plugins that you can all find, and they all do the exact same thing, even though they have a different name. So just have one on there. Um, and SSL has also helped. So if you go out and just type the average guy in your browser, you'll notice that Google has done a really great job of figuring out some nice high traffic flowing sub pages. Um, and we've definitely seen the benefits of both the sitemap and the HTTPS play its game. So if you haven't done those things yet, 
again, we talked somewhere earlier in either Home Gadget Geeks or Cyber Frontier, no, Cyber Frontiers, on how to pick up super cheap SSL certificates. Obviously, if you come out to my platform, it's 30 bucks to get SSL installed for one time. Um, so that's a great technique that has a little bit, I mean, again, it's not a life or death change in SEO, but you definitely notice a nice little pickup. Um, so that's, that's cool. So that's the question bank I have so far. Chat's Was being, that, um, that plug in XML sitemap and Google news feeds. Yeah, that sounds right. Is that the one you used? Yeah. So whichever one's currently activated. Uh, I think that's the. Sounds about right. Through, yeah. As I look through the plugins there. My favorite one is Facebook comments by Fat Panda. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, it's out there if you're on the WordPress side. Yeah, we've um, we've actually seen since we implemented that we've seen 40, 45 percent increase. I think uh, are some pretty some pretty realistic numbers uh, when we talk about uh, just getting more search traffic. The search percentage has gone up in that, and uh, and not a lot I've been doing. Um, we've basically have produced since December a podcast. I haven't really gotten too many posts out there, and so it's not like there's a whole lot of new SEO to get picked up uh, in that. I think just what was there is getting optimized. I think at one point uh, it wasn't reading the whole site, and uh, and you were able to turn that on and get that updated, and, and uh, since then it's done a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. Along those lines. Uh, let's see. Let me see if there's any other questions in here. Hey, what is uh, um, and you may not know this, but what's malvertising? John uh, or uh, Mark had put that in his note. What what is malvertising? One of the, he says one of the most dangerous infection. Yeah, methods. Uh, I've never heard it referenced by that word, but the word basically kind of means um, where the ad. You know, it's a regular ad you see in a page probably advertising some mundane thing. And then either the link that the ad was going to that was supposed to be genuine got hijacked and the page is bogus or um, they are buying basically ads on the Internet in bulk that lead to bad places and they're not being properly removed. Either way, the point is you end up clicking an ad that looks like it's for a legitimate product or service, and the next thing you know, the virus is on your computer. Another great reason why to just block ads altogether, but um, that's, a, that's kind of a, a, a pretty common thing. I would say that's been around for quite some time. It's certainly not gotten better. Um, I've never, I guess malvertising is as good a word as any to call it, but it's, it's another form of kind of link dropping, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, any, any general, or, or since we're talking about WordPress, any general WordPress security tips as we think about besides the kind of the typical stuff that we all put on our sites, anything that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, if you're conscientious about not having someone know what your CMS is, there's two kind of obvious things you can do. Number one is make sure that the theme you're using doesn't have any inline comments or other things that would give it away as being WordPress. That's very common where I can inspect the source code of your site and find out that you're running WordPress. Um, so kind of try and make sure you're installing a clean template that doesn't have any of that. Um, also, typically, like, many WordPress sites may retain uh, copyright notices on the bottom or uh, powered by WordPress, these kinds of things. You can also get rid of those to obviously help. Those are the obvious signs. Uh, the non-obvious sides are there are several plugins that will allow you to kind of easily um, redirect or get rid of your default WP login url because that's the easiest way for me to find out if you're if you're using wordpress i'm literally just going to go to your website hit forward slash wp dash admin and see if you even bothered to change that directory um it's a super easy way to find out if you're using wordpress um if you put that to a very random url or just something different it can stop bots from basically visiting your site and brute forcing on your login which also helps keep your load um, lower so those are all pretty common sense tips yeah. can also be a effective, um, uh, very, very mini honeypot in the sense that what I use is I say, yeah, go ahead and go ahead and go to my WordPress login site because that helps me identify that the traffic is no good rather than having them lurking on legitimate pages where I can't quite spot them out. I just do a query about once every few weeks where it give me all the IPs that have hit my WP login and I just drop them. <laughs> it's simple. 
I mean, you, you have to be you have to be sophisticated to crack a pretty decent password on WordPress. So it's not like a it's not a super common thing uh, to see that. I mean, it is, but it isn't. Um, how conflicting that message was, but <laughs> try nice. to, um, try to, you know, if, if you're in that position where I am, where I love doing that stuff, I mean, that's, that's an awesome way to quickly identify people who shouldn't be lurking on your site, wasting resources. But, yeah. um, but yeah, if you just don't want the traffic in the first place, just change the URL. John Nye, who's a local Omaha guy and actually will be on the show here in a couple of weeks. He's uh, scheduled to be on March 12th. He, uh, he and this sounds simple, but make sure it's staying updated, right? That's probably the the, the best and easiest yeah. thing to do. The newer the newer updates, I think anything post version four, you can turn on automatic updates, which was a little scary, much like when we turned on automatic updates back in the day with Microsoft stuff, because you're like, it's just gonna break it. So far, so good. They haven't really done too much damage yet by pushing a bad update, but um, sure. you can get WordPress updated automatically now at this point. Well, and so, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess I would generally recommend to keep that at the latest version. One thing I would say that's of note, though, is we do a lot of research on campus. Actually, my research group with Jim Pertolo, uh, the Ph.D. student, has done a lot of work on um, basically using machine learning and looking at source code commit history and that kind of stuff to say what the probability is that going to this latest version increases or decreases your attack surface, right? Because when you release a new... Speaking of attack surface, looks like we just lost Christian. Interesting. Hang tight. He'll come back in here in just a second. Let me, uh, let me, that's weird. Usually it um, doesn't go that fast. Let's uh, see if we can get him back in. I was going to ask him that question, Ken. You'd ask, how do you query that IPs that have been tried on your, uh, on your admin site? We'll ask him that when he gets back. Let's see if we can, uh, we can get Christian back in here. That's weird. I've never seen it drop that fast. Do you guys? Can you guys still hear me uh, in chat? If you would, um, if you would, it's almost like they had a power outage there. I find that hard to believe they would have one of those at uh, Maryland, but at least in the cybersecurity wing. Can you guys hear me still out there? Let's real quick. Can you still hear me? Uh, here comes. Coming back in. That was weird. What happened? My phone. Me? My phone started ringing, yeah. and then I was confused because I was still talking. And then I told you guys that I had completely lost my train of thought, and I just saw Jim frozen. And then I realized Jim was not talking back. No, we. You were like right mid sentence, and boom, you were gone. I mean, I don't know where I was at all. Just, just like that. Okay, so you you went into cyber hell. Um, let let me bring it back rather than trying. Do you remember? What you were saying? No, because you, you lost your train of thought. Ken had asked a question about how do you, how do you do that query where you can discover who's who's hit your WP dash admin. Wait, were we really on that? What happened to the last question? Uh, you you cut out. What was the question before that? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Let's just move on. Yeah, just move on. Just move on. Um, oh, I because I was saying how John Nye was going to be on the program, and then you launched into another thought. That's okay. Oh yes, no, sorry. I now remember. Yeah. Okay. I will now repeat it. Um, the the notion that updating to the latest version of any software isn't necessarily a true thing, right? It might see in, seem intuitive at first to say, oh, if I'm upgrading the latest version at the time, I'm always staying the most secure possible. I might recommend that's a, a general truth for stuff like Java, right, which we know has incredible security vulnerabilities at times, but. Um, the, one of the PhD students working for uh, Jim Pertolo, who you met, um, is doing research on um, basically looking at commit histories and versioning control systems on the open source software platform like WordPress um, to basically say, if I go to this new version, what is the probability that I, it's, I'm more secure or less secure than I once was, right? And so he had a paper um, published and presented in uh, Naples, Italy on this, and it's a big thing, right? How do you use machine learning and semi-auto-detected methods to basically say that this version I'm going to actually is better? And uh, uh, Jeremy Kroc, who is on our Cyber Frontiers episode, he has helped with that research and basically sucking off all of these different repository datas um, from the internet, from Ubuntu, Debian, etc., to do all this type of different source code analysis and say, hmm, 
Because, you know, think about it. With, with some new versions, right, they're just maintenance or security releases, right? And so those are probably ones you want to go to, right? But there's a great number of other version upgrades that are new features. And with new features comes new bugs and new security flaws. So um, that's some very interesting research going on. So, well, I would say it's a it's a generalized truth that for the average guy, you want to be staying on the latest versions. No IE6s, please. No IE6s. Um, I, I, I would make the academic comment, being the, the folk that I am, that um, there, there are plenty of people in the scientific community who would dispute that as fact. Okay. And then uh, how, do we get, how, do, how do you run that query that gets the people who've tried your uh, WP-admin account? Yeah, so if you're doing, um, I use Apache. I love Apache. Apache's my life. Um, no, it's not. Um, if if you have a default virtual host, or I mean, Apache by default normally comes up with logging, and so I have logs set up for each domain in my network, and you basically just you can actually do it all from Unix, right? So if you're logged in the SSH, you can. Uh, call the cat command, which just basically reads the whole log file out, the access.log that Apache creates with all the IP sessions and what URL it visited and what user agent string and all that. It's actually one of the most informative data sets I have in my network about what's going on. Um, you can basically cat that file out to your console and then use the grep command. So pipe that output into grep and just do a search for uh, wp-login.php and that will return you a list of all of the entries in that log file of someone going to wp-login.php and it'll have the IP address, it'll have the date, etc. There are some other fancier things you can do to basically say I want because uh, you might get, like, let's say someone brute forced that page and hit it 500 times. You're going to get a line for each time they hit it. There's very quick ways to modify that command so that you just get unique IPs that are hitting it and all that stuff. So that's just uh, some basics in uh, Unix scripting, which the ACES program covers if you want to uh, put in an application. <laughs> um, so uh, Way to uh, build the university. Yeah, but there's there's a lot of stuff out there for doing that. So, and I also there's a there's a cool little application that I've used called uh, that's not the name. Yeah, Apache Logs Viewer. Uh, it's a cute little application that you can just Google on the internet. Apache Logs Viewer uh, 4.1. And if you point it to that um, file, your access.log file, which you could probably download off your FTP, or you probably know where it is. Um, it can read that file and then very quickly break down all the different fields for you in a really nice way um, where you can basically just search what the request was and, and just do the search right in a nice graphical interface if you're not a command line guy. Just so. make sure you don't block yourself. Yeah, that's always good. Yeah, that's rule always out good. your own IP. And then, uh, let's see, Ken had asked, any recommendation on any of those plugins to change the the WP location or to, to what it says, you know, or, or how you would access it for the, the console? Uh, That's, I'd see, that'd be my question, too. You know, I was thinking about that the other day, and I thought that was just a setting in WordPress, and I went in to look for it. In the I don't think it is. I, yeah, point, yeah, right? yeah, you should do some... Maybe some research, research on that. I don't. I way back when, when the cold wind blew, I could have recommended this to you, um, but <laughs> I'm not in a position this evening to recommend one because it's been a while since I've used I gotcha. uh, an out of box solution as opposed to custom. Maybe somebody let me know. Send me a send me a tweet. Look into that at Jay Collison and just let me know what uh, what you think that is because uh, I'm I'd like to do it myself. So at this point, get uh, get the average guy TV off of that because I'm still. That's how you, you can get to it. You can see the console if you do it that way. No secret. It won't be that way for long. Somebody's going to recommend it, and uh, we'll move forward. Well, Christian, uh, let's let's wrap it with that. Uh, we're, we've been going the, the full, and the hour goes super fast. And uh, thanks for well, jumping in. If I figure out what happened to Mark, we'll get him back on. Maybe I'll have him next week. Although we talked about everything that he was going to talk about. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's kind oops. of a... Yeah, oops. Uh, it's kind of a bummer. Well, Mark, we missed you tonight. If you're listening to this, I uh, wish you could have come out. But uh, next week, I don't actually have a guest scheduled yet. I'll have to get that uh, figured out. Uh, it's a busy season, and, and uh, we'll get a guest in here. Then in a couple weeks, we've got uh, I've got some other Kevin Schoonover's coming back. We're going to do that antivirus uh, podcast that we've been talking about. John Nye, I mentioned that. John, who's out in chat today, is joining us in a couple weeks. 
uh, to talk about uh, whatever he wants to talk about, and uh, so we have him coming out. I've got a developer coming out to talk a little uh, some Windows Phone development, so what uh, this universal app development and some of that stuff for. I know that's a little heady for the average guy, but he's. I, I told him to boil it down a little bit, so he's going to come and do that as well. And then I got to get some stuff lined up yet for the rest of uh, April, so I've got some open dates and. If you're looking for me to interview a company, let me know. I've, you know, some of the bigger ones won't even touch me. So, you know, don't go, don't say like, hey, can you get IBM or Microsoft? Although I have, I can reach out to Microsoft MVPs, and uh, and so it'll be it'll be good to uh, get that rolling uh, as well and get some some guests in here. I will remind you that, uh, of course, we are live out here on Thursday nights. I apologize. This spring has been crazy for me, and uh, just. With the travel and all the things that are coming up at work, I have not been able to be as live as I want. Hopefully, uh, 203 was uh, some post-show material from from uh, from a couple shows back, and hopefully you enjoyed that. It was fun kind of putting that together and uh, and getting that out to you. But uh, we're out here Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out the average guy TV slash live. I am also live Saturday mornings. If you um, if you're thinking about podcasting or doing a podcast, one of my Favorite things to do Saturday mornings, 9.30 Central, 10.30 Eastern with uh, Dave Jackson out at Ask the Podcast Coach. Just he and I getting together, taking your live phone calls. So I just, I'd love for somebody in the community to call in and just crank us just one time. Nobody's crank called us yet, Christian, on the, on Ask the Podcast Coach. I'm waiting for that. And Dave would say, Baba Booey, somebody call in. And uh, nobody's done that yet. So maybe it'll be my community that'll call in and, uh, Get that done. If you haven't signed up, I took down uh, the amazing, not the amazing, the annoying Sumo pop-up box to sign up for the newsletter. I tried that out for a month or two and didn't get too many negative responses from you guys back on that, but I did take it down. It's a, it's enough. But if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, head out to theaverageguy.tv and select the newsletter link. In fact, this weekend, I'll be writing the next one talking about uh, the tra our travels to Washington, D.C. and such, and so if you want to get a copy of that, that doesn't really come out anywhere else, although that's not really true. If you go to theaverageguy.tv slash newsletter, you'll get last month's newsletter. So if you want to go out and take a peek and see what those are like, before you sign up, you can do that. And I send those out once a month. I'll never spam you. Uh, and uh, and just all, all kinds of helpful links, especially if you're not on Facebook or Twitter or those kinds of things. Um, I try to include some of the things that have gone on here on the network during the month. So get signed up for that. Just your email address. Give me your fake email address. That would be even better. I don't want your real one. Just give me a fake one that goes to your real one. That would be fine as well. I want to say a big thanks for using the Average Guy Tech Scholarship Fund out at theaverageguy.tv slash Amazon. And, of course, you can use uh, Amazon CA for uh, the, our friend John Zadler in Canada. And so if you're in Canada, you can use that link as well. Many of you have used it, and of course, it's not uh, hasn't been as good uh, now as it was at Christmas time. You guys, uh, you know, you guys bought some stuff at Christmas time, but I appreciate that we roll that stuff in and uh, do uh, equipment upgrades as well as give stuff away. If you guys want to test something, I will say I've got some cash. If you want to test something, all you have to do is write about it or come on the show. I'll send it out to you. You get to keep it. It's a pretty good deal. I'm just saying. It's a good deal. You should try it out. We're out here Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out at TheAverageGuy.tv live. We're going to call it quits. I actually got a note on Facebook from my brother. He said, your mother is trying to call you. She's having <laughs> problems. This, anytime I work with my mom, it, it, there's like a residual effect, right? I, she has problems. I fix them. And then there's two weeks of fixing what I, you know, what she can't like. I think tonight she's locked out of Facebook. Big tragedy. Big tragedy. So we probably won't spend too much time on the post show. I'll probably I need another one of these is what I'm gonna need <laughs> before I call her. You know how that goes. So uh, I want to say if you came out live, hang around. We'll do a little bit of, of a post show. But uh, thanks for listening. Good night, everybody. Good night.